I think we can start. Everybody is, is here. So we have now the panel of future challenges in the protection of human rights, a discussion in light of the relevant European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. And already in the title, there are some dilemmas, and I've never been participating in a panel with more dilemmas already in the title. Future, and the dilemma as to the future in COVID terms is, future is now, in a few hours time, the situation might change. And also the second dilemma is challenges. So I've, we have no idea what the challenges will be in COVID terms in a week time, in two weeks time, in two months time. So it's very difficult and challenging to, to, to answer to these, to these issues, but we'll try to do our, our best. So we have uh, judges and former judges uh, of the court to uh, address these issues. And also in the second part of this panel, we'll address some of the questions that were asked from the, from the hubs and were collected uh, from Kreshimir and Hannah yesterday. Uh, but first, let's go with the first round. Uh, what are your reflections? I'm not going to int introduce the judges anymore. They were introduced yesterday. Uh, what were your reflections uh, as to the, uh, the reports represented uh, from the hubs this morning and the discussion that had, uh, that had yesterday? So I might start from my left with Judge Paul Lemons. Paul, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, lady. I would like to say, first of all, that I was very impressed by the reports that we received from the various hubs. Um, very impressed by the depth of the discussions that have taken place and by the, uh, the, the, the engaging with uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. I would like to briefly comment on three uh, issues. One is about the separation of powers and, and decision making at the domestic level. Two is about uh, lawfulness of measures under the convention. And three is about courts and fair trial. First, separation of powers. According to the constitution, legislature has certain powers, the government has certain powers. With the pandemic, of course, this has been disrupted. The system of uh, distribution of powers um, we have seen that in many, if not all states, and not only in the southeast of Europe, that uh, laws have been adopted in order to transfer more competences to the governments. Um, we have seen that in certain cases, in certain countries, states of emergency were declared to do that. Maybe not necessary, I cannot judge that. It depends on the constitutional system uh, of each country. Um, but I would like to say is that where broad powers have been transferred to the executive, there is an even greater need for controls. Preventive control, and I think that I heard the ombudsperson's uh, role in this respect, but also control a posteriori, and that is then a parliamentary control and a judicial control. And I will come back to uh, the, the, both of them. So this is an issue that has to be settled according to the principles of domestic constitutional law. Whether or not you need a derogation there, I, I don't really think that derogations were that necessary, but perhaps in certain cases it could be a necessity. Let me turn to my sec second point, the lawfulness of measures that have been taken, uh, the challenges that have been brought, that may still be brought before the domestic courts, perhaps later also before the European Court of Human Rights, how to examine that, how to assess this. The first uh, condition is that of the legality of the measures, the compatibility with domestic law. Um, what, what I see in many countries is that because of the unexpected uh, emergence of this pandemic and the quickly developing situation, it is very difficult for courts in, in many cases to interpret and to apply the rules in a very strict way. I see that very often courts accept 
tolerate more in this situation than what they would normally tolerate in, in other situations. I think one has to be realistic here. Um, strict constitutional law may have to be uh, yeah, put a little bit aside and the constitution and the constitutional rules have to be read in, light, in the light of the situation. One thing about uh, the role of parliament here, um, we have heard that in some countries parliament ratifies what has been done. That can be a good technique. I would say provided that this was already um, provided beforehand, that the transfer of powers to the government provided for a subsequent control by the parliament. That is a very good technique then. If such a, um, intervention, a later intervention by parliament has not been foreseen, it might be a bit questionable from the point of view of interference by the legislature in perhaps pending litigation. The second uh, condition is the legitimate aim, very often, of course, the protection of health. The question have been, has been raised, uh, what about the me uh, measures, of the effects of which continue to exist after the end of the pandemic or after the end of the state of emergency. I don't think that that is necessarily a problem. It all has to be seen uh, in light of the concrete circumstances. Some measures indeed may have the pandemic as a, a, an, an excuse, an, an opportunity, and may then go on. Why, why should not some measures be also very good for the future? Then we have the last condition, the necessity in a democratic society. I would say here uh, two elements. One is about the decision-making process. To what extent were governmental decisions uh, based on opinions of experts? I think it's important that experts were involved, although some of these experts, experts may sometimes have uh, been themselves very confusing, and at the end uh, the government must take a decision, but I think that some, some scientific basis for a lot of measures would be, I would say, almost a requirement. And uh, as far as the effects of the measures are concerned, the proportionality, that depends, of course, on the circumstances of each case. Indeed, one may sometimes have the impressions that measures were overly broad in order to achieve the aim pursued. But I would nevertheless like to point again to the fact that we are dealing with a pandemic um, of which the, all the characteristics were not really known at the moment when decisions were taken. And for me, this whole pandemic also has brought uh, into the limelight the question, the relationship between individuals and the society in which they live, a high need of solidarity of individuals within a given society. I would also say a need of solidarity of an intergenerational nature. Very often it is said that measures are taken in order to protect the older generation. This is partly true, uh, and there is also a need then for uh, solidarity from the younger generation, but that needs also to be explained, I think. Of course, it has been said here various times in this solidarity, there is a need for an attention, special attention for vulnerable groups. Um, sometimes they need, indeed, special measures. I was struck by one example that was given uh, with respect to the right to education. That's all fine to have home work, etc., and education through the internet. But if you have certain groups where there is no access to the internet, there is no enjoyment of the right to education either. Let me come to my last point, uh, and I will be more brief on this point, courts and the fair trial. We have heard uh, a number of presentations where the, the right to a fair trial was mentioned, where difficulties with uh, video conferences were mentioned. As I said in my presentation yesterday, it, as a matter of principle, I would say hearings by video conference are not a big problem. They can satisfy the requirements of the right to a fair and a public trial. But the question is, of course, how is that implemented in practice? And, from, um, and the real possibility of parties to participate and to confer with their lawyers. I would only say, I could only give the following recommendation. When you are a judge and you are sitting uh, on the bench and you have a video link with uh, some parties or lawyers, 
try not only to examine whether you can see these uh, parties, whether you can follow what is happening, but try to put yourself in their position. Is everything going well so that they are able to effectively participate? Um, and I understand very well that has also been mentioned that problems with can increase with the complexity of the cases. So maybe for very complex cases, it might be better for uh, to wait for better times to come. Um, and let me end with the publicity of the hearings for the general public. Um, as I already thought that would be the problem, it's IT again. Um, we have heard that IT is often an issue. It's not only an issue that has arisen with the pandemic. Uh, I think that courts should try to convince their uh, governments to do more for the computerization of courts. Uh, it will also help to uh, tackle the backlog of cases. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your intervention and uh, sharing your thoughts with, with us. Uh, Mirjana, please, the floor is yours. What are your reactions to the presentations from the hubs? Thank you, Lady. Uh, first of all, uh, the topic of our panel today, uh, the future challenges is defined by the challenges from yesterday and today. What we were facing uh, uh, several months ago and due to, to pandemic crisis, what we are facing nowadays, today will define what will be the future challenges of uh, the uh, courts which are dealing with human rights. Uh, I fully agree with Paul that there should be clear uh, separation of powers. We have seen through the, uh, the pandemic crisis situations when executive power was trying to interfere by decrease into the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. So the courts, national courts, should try not only to, in, to preserve their impartiality and independence, that then they, they should try also uh, to have a uh, stronger statements and stronger appearance in public when it comes to human rights protection. Here, I don't refer only to the constitutional courts, but also to the Supreme Courts, also to the Association of Judges. They should be more visible uh, if they are intentions of uh, influencing their impartiality and independence. Then uh, the courts will face probably the challenges of uh, not only technical nature, IT equipment and IT illiteracy should be accompanied with changes of the methodology of work. Sometimes some changes might be done without in interfering into the legislative frame. Some changes might be done by the rules of procedure of the courts uh, quickly, efficiently, and the courts will have to adopt to the challenges of today or better say tomorrow. So use of IT equipment, use of online work should be something which we should uh, develop probably uh, in a better way. Uh, when it comes to uh, future challenges on concrete human rights, we have seen from the summary of the hubs in different cities that courts are facing already cases which are more or less linked with specific rights, which we were uh, dealing in, in uh, yesterday's uh, session. Uh, and the courts will deal probably still with rights which are coming from the 18th or 19th century, like prohibition of torture, degrading and inhuman treatment, but this time, they will be a result of the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And at the same time, co courts will have to face new challenges dealing with bioethic uh, uh, problems, which will again derive from COVID pandemic crisis. But for sure, most of our courts will face cases which will raise uh, the problems with right on liberty and security, uh, right to freedom of movement, uh, right to education, 
And all these will be linked with the right to private life and also possible discrimination of different groups. Elderly people were mentioned here, and I expect that some of the constitutional courts will deal with these topics as well. Now, pandemic is a, a situation which we thought it will be of a temporary character and it will last probably much shorter than it is the case in this concrete situation. And therefore, we will have to bear in mind that this is really unpredictable uh, situation. And the two core principles, legality and proportionality, should be on uh, mind of those who are using different measures. Measures which will interfere in human rights should be always reasonable, necessary, and they should be always proportionate to the aim which was uh, meant to be achieved. So um, I expect that national courts will help the work of the European Court of Human Rights in a way that uh, multilateral cooperation among the courts uh, will be increased. Forums like this one will help on this direction, exchange of views, but also uh, national courts should follow the work of other courts when it comes to the specific cases which will derive from the uh, pandemia. So, Mr. Chairman, I will stop here and probably we will have chance to answer questions raised by our colleagues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mirjana. <laughs> now your reactions, Anja, from the HUBS reports. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to thank the HUBS uh, um, very much for the very intriguing reports. I think this is very valuable for us also to get a picture from the region and the, the challenges that you are facing uh, currently. I found it very intriguing to, as a general message, to hear that um, the, it is primarily the role of the courts to define the red lines. And that in the region, they, uh, a number of courts have taken all, on this responsibility to, to go on and, and to define these kinds of red lines. I think uh, that also shows that the implementation of the European Convention of Human Rights is a shared responsibility. It's not that we in, in Strasbourg, we are sitting there and uh, we will probably be waiting another a couple of years, uh, but it's primarily uh, the, the courts on the ground who, who are dealing with this issue currently and who, who need to engage with the question, where are the red lines based on the, on the convention? So what I've heard, of, I found this very reassuring and I will, would also like to add that <coughs> our, in the beginning of the pandemic, we thought, oh, this is a huge challenge for the rule of law. Uh, because we thought uh, we, we need to react and, and, and um, well, the, the pandemic uh, causes a lot of problems for human rights in, in the end. And with a half year experience, I would say that uh, we have seen that the rule of law is even more important in these situations of, uh, of pandemia and emergency where uh, it is important to, to draw the lines. They may not always be the same lines that we would be drawing in other situations, but we always are confronted with the question of proportionality. And, um, let, and therefore, uh, what colleagues have already uh, alluded to on yesterday's panel is that the different aspects of the rule of law, like, for example, the pr principle of legality, the foreseeability, the proportionality, are so essential in, uh, in going about and in preserving human rights without really endangering um, the, 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 the population by exposing them to, to a tre tremendous threat. Um, therefore, I think a lesson that we, we will probably learn is that in future, we need to focus more also on emergency legislation. I think we have forgotten that over the past decades because we were per perhaps not so much confronted with emergencies to the same extent that uh, uh, this happened in other times. So I think in the future, we should also think about what are the parameters for the legislative framework in order to be able to address these kinds of challenges in the future. 
Um, so if we can take this lesson, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think this would one, be one of the future challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. And now, last but not least, please, Ivana, your reactions from the region. Thank you, lady. Um, first of all, I'm really impressed uh, with uh, this forum, and I, I actually, uh, I've gotten several uh, messages from you, from the region, telling me that this forum is even better than previous ones, it's the best one. And I'm very happy because we invested all a lot of energy, positive energy, to address so important uh, issues. Uh, I'm also impressed that our, like telling our constitutional court, meaning the constitutional court from the Western Balkan countries, were active during pandemic, proactive. And I'm, I'm proud, uh, not only because you make our job uh, uh, less um, uh, complicated, because the cases are not going to come to Strasbourg, because you properly address them. Uh, and for those cases that uh, you have dilemma or um, the applicants would think that uh, you didn't, the, 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 the judicial authorities did not give a right answer, the court in Strasbourg is going to deal, definitely. But for most of the, ca for most of the cases, as I could see now, I would say that they would be also challenging cases for us. Maybe some of them would even deserve grand chamber approach. Uh, but uh, because it's not easy to actually structure fair balancing between conflicting rights in pandemic, in a state of emergency, uh, or to actually, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very difficult. It's uh, less difficult to define uh, the balancing between um, individual rights requirements, protection of individual rights requirements, and obligation or duty to protect public health. Of course, this is just my, my, my opinion for the time being. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I, I would like to subscribe to those who emphasized that this is not only health, but also economic crisis. And I listened carefully uh, Madam Stajnik from Croatia, actually Agent Stajnik uh, mentioned uh, a lot of economic uh, and labor connecting rights uh, came into play during pandemic, unexpectedly I would say, but uh, the reality and some other colleagues mentioned a uh, problem of uh, individuals uh, to receive their salaries during pandemic, being in self-isolation or imposed self-isolation. I would like to, to join Anya and Miriana and also Professor Kirstich, who actually emphasized that uh, importance of clear, forcible legislation is the key to, to solve problems. Uh, it's obvious that uh, some countries would need new legislation uh, on a state of emergency. Some of them would need clear guidelines uh, from which it would be seen what is expected from individuals, from public, but also from authorities, and to help the courts and ombuds ombudsman to actually address the issue properly. Here we see that the role of ombudsman is even more important during pandemic. And uh, what is uh, especially uh, important for me is that uh, we have to address all together uh, the fact that uh, some individuals, not only persons belonging to vulnerable groups or social disadvantaged persons, marginalized groups, but a lot of individuals were put in situations that are not in conformity with inherent human dignity. Uh, when uh, authorities published the name and addresses of individuals who were forced to be in self-isolation due to protecting measures, it's not only breach of the right to privacy, but it's also the, the, the path for stigmatization by others. Many people complained 
than by, by being put on a list with exact names, um, addresses, and the dates of arrival into a country. They were put to actually uh, hu in humiliating uh, position by other individuals, neighbors, uh, and others who actually tried to control uh, them totally. Of course, I agree that it's very difficult for the authorities to provide a whole setup and to obtain the control of a movement in accordance to need of uh, control the pandemic. But also, this is, this is an important lesson to be learned, and I'm very happy that the Constitutional Court of Montenegro actually reacted in the right direction. So I'm not, I'm not trying to actually commend the court from the country I'm coming from, but this is obviously the case uh, which is adequate to, to be mentioned. <clears throat> um, also concerning Article 3 cases in respect of domestic violence, uh, the rate is uh, actually uh, much, much higher. Uh, we are talking about uh, data of 30 percentage of... Uh, of, uh, of increase, but uh, in reality, uh, it is always much more because the victims are not ready and to, 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 to ready to, to actually uh, report, but also during pandemic where the freedom of movement is limited. This would be also, uh, this is also a problem. So here I would say that uh, requirements set up by the court in Strasbourg for effective investigation are, would be, very important to be followed. And it is important that the persons responsible for the investigation uh, has to prove that they are practically independent, practically independent, independent uh, in accordance with the principles set in Barbu Angelescu versus Romania in far 2004. Of course, we talk about prompt, speedy, and thorough investigation, which is in pandemic, uh, of course, not uh, uh, expected to be as prompt as uh, it would be uh, in the times where the pandemic is not present. But uh, the authorities have to show uh, the evidence that they've done all that they could. Let me also remind you that the investigation uh, must uh, lead to identification and punishment of the persons responsible and according to the court. It is not an obligation of result, but of means. It is repeated several times. It is also emphasized in Nacho versus Bulgaria. And uh, it is, it is uh, conditio sine qua non to also address uh, this uh, uh, the, the, the types of violations in terms of, uh, of, of gender violence, of, of domestic violence, and uh, Article 3. And finally, Article 14. Uh, I'm going to stop after this, but uh, the cases of multiple discrimination are more and more present. Uh, in pandemic, we heard from different hubs that persons belonging to national minorities, ethnic minorities, especially Roma, Roma women and the girls, are uh, put in an even worse situation than in times before pandemic. And I think there is a positive obligation of a state to address this issue uh, as it should be addressed uh, for the victims to, to suffer less or uh, to be protected better. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm staying uh, at disposal for the questions. Thank you, Ivana, for these, uh, these reactions. So now I think we can we can move into the second part of this panel, which would be the the questions from the from the hubs. Now, uh, what I am asking to to Krasimir and to Hannah is whether some of the questions from the hubs might have already been answered from the from the uh, interventions of the panelists of this morning. So in this case, there might not be a need to, to repeat exactly. the question. So yeah. please prioritize yeah. and go to the questions that haven't been answered if this is the case. So uh, a good number of questions, in fact, was answered 
uh, by your interventions now. So I would really continue with those that were more maybe not addressed and were more specific. So uh, the first one was about uh, effective access to justice in the context of COVID, in particular to superior courts, and then the way in which this may affect the rule on, of, on exhaustion of domestic remedies from the perspective of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, further question was, and we received in fact a few questions on the same topic yesterday, which was about fake news and the freedom of expression, Article 10, in the context of uh, COVID. Uh, then uh, there were a few issues raised with respect to uh, different contact tracing applications that were introduced, and in particular the way how governments uh, could tackle the, the simply technological limitations of certain applications or the way in which certain applications operate. Uh, there was also uh, a question uh, about the use of data which is obtained from these applications, uh, or rather reuse of that data for other purposes. Uh, specific example was given on elections. So whether uh, the data that was obtained and used in the context of COVID could later be reused, for example, for the purposes of electoral process. Then uh, there was question about forceful dispersal of assemblies, including by means of criminal prosecution and by physical force. And then finally, uh, there was a question on access to property by non-nationals. So non-nationals of a country are restricted, for, are prevented from accessing their property in another country, and how would all that uh, 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 be viewed from the perspective of the convention? Who wants to who wants to start with answering any of the questions also from the other judges and participants around the table? Please, Anya, you've raised your hand first. I don't want to preclude please, anyone else. Uh, there were two questions that were directed to the issues that I raised yesterday, so perhaps I I may um, answer them. The first question related to fake news. Uh, I had only had a chance to touch on, uh, on this very shortly, um, um, various measures have been um, adopted uh, in the Council of Europe how to uh, confront uh, fake news. Um, but as I has, have pointed out yesterday, this is basically also a question of proportionality. So the question is really how to counter um, uh, fake news without uh, seriously limiting the freedom of expression because any kind of restriction on freedom of expression, uh, prohibiting any kind of information that runs counter to what we perceive to be the real truth, has a chilling effect on freedom of expression more generally. Therefore, this requires a, a very careful balancing and uh, addressing also alternative means. And I would think, as I've mentioned yesterday, for example, Government information, government information campaigns about the facts may be a very effective re, um, uh, uh, means to counter disinformation because I understand that disinformation can be a huge threat also to any kind of public health issues because uh, if the, the uh, population does not believe in the measures taken by the government, if they don't believe in the existence of COVID-19 and so on. This is a huge uh, threat, I recognize that. So in response to this, uh, I, um, we have seen in a number of Council, uh, Council of Europe states that uh, governments have been very careful in setting up information, databases, providing a lot of information also on the grounds of the reasons for adopting certain measures. And this is an ongoing uh, obligation. That does not necessarily mean that the government should have a monopoly on this kind of information. But I think, um, uh, in all, I would think that uh, diversity and plurality in the end are the best safeguards of freedom of expression and also in response um, to, to fake news, because then you, if you counter these fake news actively by providing 
other information that you have, this becomes more persuasive. So um, now turning to the question about dissolution. Uh, of course, I cannot talk about any kind of concrete cases over here, but uh, uh, there is one case that I was able to, uh, to come up with. Uh, it's a French case about the dissolution of a, um, an assembly where the court had to analyze whether um, the dissolution of an occupation of a church in France, um, uh, which was combined with a hunger strike, uh, was permissible under Article 11. This is the CIS versus France case, um, an interesting case, because um, there, the, uh, after two months of occupation, the uh, uh, authorities came to the conclusion that the conditions were wholly inadequate um, in terms of sanitary conditions, and that, um, that they decided to terminate um, this um, uh, uh, um, this gathering and the occupation of the church in Paris um, um, after two months. So what we see over here also, they did not intervene right away. I think that the time element was a very important thing. The level of the threat was very, very important also. And as I said beforehand, um, this is also a question of proportionality. Um, first of all, measures should be taken that... Um, that are not general and don't uh, issue uh, 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 very overbroad uh, measures, but uh, to be aware of the uh, particular situation on the ground. So even if we have a pandemia, uh, we still need to have this kind of uh, proportionate address. Now, does this uh, uh, allow dispersal and the use of force? Um, we have um, quite elaborate um, uh, jurisprudence on that. Um, uh, and um, we, uh, the court has said that a dispersal of, a, of an assembly may only be done on the basis of serious risks, which cannot be countered by alternative means. So it, they must be provided by law. It's, again, a very important element of the legality. And then the, even if you, uh, there is some use of force, it may only be the last resort and it must be strictly proportionate. Generally speaking, there is a caveat against any kind of force. So um, it must be proportionate to the legitimate aim. This is the jurisprudence of the court um, so far in these issues, and I think that it also applies uh, to current situations. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, other reactions, please, Mirana? I will try to answer first uh, the question which was linked with the use of data or reuse of data which were collected uh, for the purposes of COVID-19 um, and then reusing them in electoral uh, process. So uh, this uh, issue might be linked with two uh, possible uh, violations of rights. First of all, uh, right on private life if data are used for purposes for which they were not collected. So the states should be very careful when they are collecting data that there should be clear legal grounds for what they are collecting and how they are collecting. And then using them for another purpose will uh, raise uh, serious doubts about right on private life but not only private life when it comes to the uh, right uh, on um, uh, election uh, to be elected or to vote, then if these data are used on this direction, then we will have another uh, situation or another issue uh, on the table. So there should be clear uh, legislative frame, there should be clear uh, legal aim what was the purpose for collecting this data and how they will kept uh, and who will use this data. Uh, also, when it comes to the, to the question linked with the access um, to property of uh, non-citizens, uh, this might be uh, an issue of interest not only for the countries in the region, but it will be probably an issue which will be raised more broadly because even citizens inside of the European Union were not able 
to enjoy their property uh, around the countries of the European Union, not all the time. Some of the measures were uh, preventing use of property or they were um, imposing the control of the use of uh, uh, property concern. So uh, when it comes to the uh, measures which were uh, used by the governments during the pandemic crisis, and some of them are still uh, in force, the governments should be uh, aware that these measures will have to be of temporary nature. Uh, as longer the measures are lasting, it will be more problematic to explain the legis legitimate aim of these measures. So the measures should be proportionate to the aim again. Uh, and then uh, it, it, the, the level of interference might also raise the, the, the issue of general principle of peaceful enjoyment of property. And here we have case law of the European Court of Human Rights, which is deriving from situations uh, where the armed conflicts were creating uh, uh, such a problematic situations. And probably uh, best case to refer is the case of Cy Cyprus versus Turkey, where the general principles are uh, drafted. But uh, uh, the, to conclude, the measures linked with COVID should be uh, clear uh, also, they should be in line with the necessity. Are they necessary in certain moment? And are they proportionate with the aim which was meant to be uh, achieved? So um, I think this will be uh, one of the uh, elements which will be first raised in front of the national courts. And it might happen that such a case in certain time will come in front of the European Court of Human Rights. That's why uh, lessons from the past months should serve uh, for drafting clear directions, predictable uh, instructions or decrees when it comes to the measures which governments are overtaking in connection with the property and peaceful enjoyment of the property. Thank you. Thank you, Mirjana. Is there anyone who wants to add anything on, on this issue? If I can give the floor to myself just to add, especially as far as the question of collecting data and, <coughs> I'm sorry, using them for another purpose. In the, uh, in the guide is included the case of LH versus Latvia, which uh, refers to the fact that in Latvian system, uh, the health data were collected by uh, uh, a body called Madeki, which used these data for some fitness to work purposes and etc. This reminds me as well of another case, which is LL versus France has not been included in the guide, but might be included in the updated version of the guide in which the medical data were used in divorce proceedings. Uh, and then there was an issue, clarity, purpose, and et cetera. And especially on purpose, the court said, you have a problem there on the way how the data was stored and were, was, was used. And we'll see uh, as well uh, how far, because the case of Big Brother is before the Grand Chamber, of course, has to do with telecommunication, which is something, something else, but we'll see whether the general principles of that judgment uh, or decision, nobody knows, will we'll, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll tackle these, will address these, uh, these questions directly or in indirectly. Other interventions as far as, please, Paul, please. Just because there is also this uh, question about the exhaustion of domestic remedies. Um, the rule is, as you know, as the one, the person who asked the question obviously also knows that uh, domestic remedies have to be exhausted before a complaint can be brought before the European Court of Human Rights, that there is also 
uh, a derogation in certain circumstances which depend from case to case when the remedy appears not to be effective. But let me say that the European Court is quite restrictive in accepting the existence of such derogations. It must be quite clear, and not only from one case, but from a series of cases or from a really long time before the Supreme Court is able to decide that the remedy has become ineffective. I don't think that I can say more because it all depends on the circumstances. But this is the general, I would say, methodological framework to examine such issues. Oh, you have to. Um, sorry, not necessarily on the exhaustion question, but I wanted to make a general comment on the uh, uh, privacy and data protection. I really have nothing to add to uh, uh, what uh, the two of you just said, but I wanted to make a comment on 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 the question of elections, uh, which I th I find uh, fascinating, um, and I find in particular because. Uh, it seems to generate a tension between the two basic requirements uh, in that provision of the convention, the requirement to hold elections at regular intervals, and of course that they should reflect the, the opinion of the free will of the people. Uh, I think this is something that many countries and jurisdictions are grappling with. I think in the region we've already had one or two countries that have gone through this process and had to make up their minds. Um, in some uh, jurisdictions, uh, the flexibility can be quite limited. I think that the U.S. election has been in the news, and there uh, the postponing is really not an option, for example, just by way of example, because the date is set in the Constitution. In other settings, there might be a bit more flexibility. But there is uh, a live tension uh, about something that is really uh, the the fundamental event in, in every democracy. Uh, it is not an ideal time in some ways to hold elections in terms of the ability to campaign, in terms of uh, voting rights, people being actually able to, to vote through, through different methods. Um, and at the same time, the further you push them, then the, the bigger the issue, the tension is with the uh, elections to build at regular intervals. But here, um, I think will be fascinating to watch. I think there is room to learn from the experience of the countries that have gone through this process. There are others that have elections coming up. And I can only endorse here uh, uh, the, the sentiment expressed by uh, uh, my colleague, Judge Yelich, that it is actually quite impressive to see how active the highest tribunals have been in the region, perhaps slightly more so than the rest of Europe. And, and that, is, uh, that gives some confidence that uh, if questions about elections do rise, that they uh, hopefully can be addressed in, in, in due time. The, the speed of some of this decision making has also been impressive. Thank you. Thank you, Darian. Your, your intervention on elections and pandemic and regular kind of holding of the elections reminds me a little bit of the case of Sidaropoulos and Giacomopoulos versus Greece. And one of the arguments of the two applicants who for completely different reasons couldn't go physically in Greece and vote was, well, Greek government should provide for electronic voting at the time. 2012, 2013. But the court kind of was, was short of somehow obliging the states and say, you have to introduce such a system. The question is now whether with this kind of general problem of assuring the participation of voters in the elections, your position will change in that regard. So let's, let's see, of course, there are technical, uh, technological ad kind of advances as well, so the situation has changed. But it is, it is a very interesting debate how to find the balance between, between the two. So thank you very much for your intervention. Other 
interventions are please please Tim perhaps just two points on earlier contributions um, my colleague Anya Zaibert Four made the point about emergency legislation and of course that's right but I think one of the things that's worth bearing in mind is that this um, emergency is of a very different nature of those which we've encountered in the past so I think it is worth reflecting on how much the case law we have on emergencies responses to 9-11 various other human emergencies terrorism related or war related actually translate into one that is caused by a naturally occurring problem rather than um, by a human adversary and we've seen various countries who respond to this as if it was a war against an enemy but of course it's a different scenario and I'm not sure one can necessarily take for granted that you can translate a response also from our court in relation to terrorism related emergencies as a as a given and I just wanted to add that in a sense and then just to add to I think the point um, my colleague Judge Yelich uh, and um, Judge Pavli just made about the impressive response of the courts and um, Judge Yelich mentioned the fact that um, by the impressive work of the domestic courts our job is made easier um, and I think it's not only made easier because as she indicated you know some cases might not come to us but these are all novel issues which we are all grappling with and I hope the last two days have shown that we're all grappling with where the answers lie and actually careful consideration by the domestic courts and their reasoning and their engagement with our jurisprudence and with the problem on the ground both in terms of law but also in terms of the fact-finding is something which is, in my view, an absolute essential for us as a court to be able to deal with it even when a case comes to us. So, again, I'm very encouraged by uh, what I've seen and what the, what the courts in the region have done. Uh, and it is, as I said, it's not only helpful, but it's an essential because various of the certainly factual aspects and some of the engagements of the, of the balancing, the more clearly that is expressed by the domestic courts, the more clearly the domestic courts have engaged with it, the better we are able, even when a case comes to us, to actually engage with it on the back of and in its form of dialogue with the domestic courts rather than having to try and, um, in a slightly more um, distanced and divorced way, to kind of try and, um, as we would say, reinvent the wheel. So I just wanted to add that to the contributions we've had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Other reactions I was just thinking loud about this issue on uh, admissibility that Paul uh, raised and was one of the one of the questions and I was thinking in the framework of a situation where the deadlines at domestic level have been suspended and sometimes also in the region how you are going to interpret compliance, one of the criteria in admissibility, compliance with national rules, especially taking into account whether this suspension has carefully followed the evolution of the situation in the ground as far as COVID is related, for example, or not. That's an additional, might be, an additional an analysis to be, to be made. And coupled with that is the question of the effectiveness of these remedies in a COVID situation. So, okay, the deadlines are suspended because they are not effective. But where you draw the line between suspension out of necessity and effectiveness that should start at a certain point. So it becomes, uh, to my reading, in some cases, uh, quite, quite complicated or at least an analysis to be taken into, into account. Please, Mariana. Uh, well, I think this is a new situation for national courts as well. And as, mm. as you said, uh, at the level of the uh, national, uh, at the different uh, uh, countries, this was differently decided. 
And some of the hubs already mentioned that there was a lack of clear and precise guide guidelines when it comes to the uh, procedural aspects and how the court should behave. Uh, I think it's uh, more clear in a situation where there was a state of emergency and in those cases, like in my country, mm -hmm. the deadlines were prolonged until the moment when the state of emergency uh, was uh, lasting. So after the, the state of emergency, uh, all uh, procedures are held in line with the procedural laws. It depends on the, which law. But then, uh, these cases, when they will come to the court, in my view, uh, the admissibility should be uh, judged on the basis of the individual case and on the basis of the measures taken from a side of the country. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, can, you can imagine everything was blocked at least for a several months at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you will see from different cases, even now when we are dealing with cases at the level of Supreme Court or at the level of uh, different Supreme Courts, we are looking very carefully in the deadlines and uh, uh, we are trying to act always in favor of the applicant. Mm -hmm. So the courts should be less formalistic in a situations where there were no clear and precise guidelines at the national level. And once the case will come in, the, in front of the, the high level court, then because there will be uh, chances during the procedure of appeal to discuss the question of uh, the deadlines and uh, national courts will, as Tim was saying, will certainly give you enough facts and enough elements to help your work in establishing the admissibility at the moment when the case will come in front of the court in Strasbourg. Uh, and the, the truth is that we all are dealing for this type of situation uh, for the first time in history. And uh, I must say that I was um, positively surprised how courts in the region were dealing. Mm -hmm. Because as you can see that none of the country was closing the courts. Uh, countries from Southeast Europe were dealing with the cases in, uh, in a criminal uh, cases uh, on a daily uh, procedure. Sometimes they were working online, but most of the time they were obliged to come in the court. They were obliged to, uh, especially those who, who were dealing uh, with the cases which were involved, involving immigrants, uh, cases where the deprivation of liber liberty was on the table. And the question was how to protect judges and at the same time, how to protect the participants in the procedure, including the, uh, the asylum seekers or immigrants in such a cases. And we have uh, good practices in the region in this area, but probably this is uh, for another forum, and I will stop here. Thank you, Mirjana. Other interventions? I gather that we've got a late question which means that we are being watched in the region. <laughs> we have uh, one further question. It is about visits in prison and to which extent can this, uh, uh, what are the requirements of Article 8, whether prolonged uh, restrictions on visits, which did happen in some jurisdictions, in many jurisdictions, in fact, uh, uh, to what extent is this all compatible with Article 8? Uh, I would like just to share my, my thoughts. Uh, and of course they are based on, on, on our case law, but also on international legal approach. I think that uh, positive obligation of a state to protect the health of detain detainees uh, is, uh, is a crucial here. It has actually priority over uh, respect uh, of the rights enshrined in Article 8. 
uh, and this goes along with the actually this is international law this is in situations covering by humanitarian law Geneva Convention protocols and also uh, our convention uh, case law uh, and universal approach to human rights standards uh, protection of human rights standards so um, I would like uh, to stress that uh, it is more important to provide for uh, prisoners uh, to uh, respect, uh, to be able to respect uh, protection measures, uh, this, uh, to, to, to provide, uh, uh, I gave an example of, of uh, French authorities uh, yesterday, uh, where the prisons were actually um, in pandemic, unable to uh, protect, to actually, the, the, the national authorities reacted in a way to um, uh, leave a space for 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 uh, possibility of introducing measures. So the the number of uh, prisoners decreased due to pandemic requirements uh, in order to provide uh, uh, distance and uh, realization of, uh, of uh, policies concerning uh, addressing pandemic. Uh, and that would be my uh, comment uh, in this respect. Because we are all, we all, we are aware that uh, Article 8 is uh, derogative that uh, pandemic is one of those situations in which uh, restrictive measures could be justified and usually are. So visits, um, right to privacy, interaction, uh, in my opinion, should uh, be less important than protection of uh, our public uh, health uh, and respect in the, uh, of the measures taken in that regard. Other other reactions this is an issue you have a section in the guide about about this especially related to children uh, and the, and the case of Horridge versus Poland of 2012 is is uh, referred there but also in these in these cases if physical contacts are not able to be maintained and kind of guaranteed by the authorities other means of contact such as online contact whatever they should be kind of find a way to 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 compensate somehow the, somehow, the yes. you know. other interventions. I don't think there is any issue left at the moment, <laughs> but we have just opened a huge debate over all COVID related issues under the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, so I can conclude this panel and we leave the floor for the following, for the conclusions. Thank you very much, and thanks as well to the participants from the region for their contributions and for the questions, because they uh, were able to, 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 to feed our discussion this morning. Thank you.